ladies and gentlemen, depending on where you are in the world, good day, good, good evening or good morning to you and welcome uh, to this panel on civil society and youth leadership. I'm sure we will enjoy a productive and insightful discussion today. And this discussion is part of a much wider World Academy-led exercise in soul searching on the issue of global leadership. We've come together to reflect more specifically here on the best strategies available to civil society actors today. And we ask ourselves, how can civil society and youth lead the way to a transformation of our societies and economies to become more inclusive, peaceful, and above all, sustainable? Now, of course, civil society actors are very diverse culturally and also thematically in, in what they are focusing on. And in the short planning window that we had available, we tried our best to reflect some of that diversity among our panelists. Uh, but there is room for improvement in future gatherings. So please step forward and join the civil society working group and help us prepare for the main event, which is the Congress in Geneva this October at the United Nations. Please also feel free to promote thoughtfully our network among any other important potential contributors or stakeholders you may know. Now our discussion today responds to a question of vast importance. How can civil society and youth actors bring about the necessary change to secure a positive future for all humanity and for all life on this planet. Like all other sectors and structures, civil society is now being put to the test. We suddenly find ourselves in the midst of an inadvertent adventure. The door, it seems, is shut behind us. The path ahead is still dark. New strategies and much courage will be needed to meet the challenge we ourselves have created. Where we each may lack confidence, we can find confidence in one another's different capabilities and also in the multitude of people within civil society at large who share our aspirations and desire for positive change. Before we begin, just two housekeeping matters. First of all, I would like to stay in touch with participants in this panel, and if you agree, uh, please provide some contact details by clicking on the link for the participant list that you will find at the very beginning of the chat history. So just click it, it's a Google Doc, and you put down your information, there's a data security statement at the top. Uh, second, we have a fairly tight schedule in this first session, and I ask panelists to please keep their answers quite short, that is somewhat under two minutes for each question. It can be a little bit shorter sometimes, you might, then some questions you may have more to say on than others, so we can be flexible in that way. But we want to make sure we have some discussion at the end so that uh, uh, all the participants who are not visible on the screen will have an opportunity also to ask some questions. Uh, please everyone submit your questions only through the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen, and do not use the chat. Um, and I also should say that we have a second session at 1 p.m. today. It will be slightly longer, and that will allow us to have more time for questions from, from the floor. I also would like to now introduce to you my co-chair of the Civil Society and Youth Working Group, uh, Obiora Eke, from, uh, who's the director of Club Ethics in Geneva. Obiora, would you like to say a few words? Thank you very much, Thomas. It is a tremendous privilege all of us have to be part of transforming our world. We do know that we need change, and change is a permanent factor in human societies. Human beings can change either way, for good or for better. What is the possibility for change which civil society actors and youth and when we look at youth most of them are in higher education institutions many of them are in businesses and skills and trade 
youth as a potential. They make the largest population of the world. How come it that in the 21st century, the youth and civil society organizations are not powering and engineering the world towards the world of our dreams? This is a panel with the World Academy of Science and Arts and all of you gathered around the world where even from my own view, from globeethics.net in Geneva, we try to bring value to this topic. I look forward to a rich conversation and thank all those who are panelists. Thank you very much, uh, Obiora. Uh, and your very, very true words, we really need to fire up and that's what we're here for. And we want to be very practical. This is about strategies, not about complaining about all the problems there are and all the obstacles, because we know quite a lot about that already. We want to focus on the positive, on strategies, on being smart and getting organized within this sector. That's what it's about. And Obiora is also a, one of the panelists. Uh, and let me introduce the other panelists. First, uh, Associate Professor Mariana Todorova, who is a, a World Academy Fellow and also uh, 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 it's the Bulgarian Academy of Sciences and Millennium Project in Bulgaria. Dr. Ash Bashari from the uh, Protect Our Planet movement or POP movement in New York. And Ms. Hongmei Li, a student leader from Sky Campus Happiness Program, who's also engaged at UNMG, MGCY. Um, now, the, the other speaker uh, who uh, I believe has not turned up yet is Dr. David Harris, who uh, was the principal investigator of the Security and Sustainability Guide uh, that the uh, uh, World Academy uh, initiated uh, and also um, uh, uh, engaged at Canadian Park, Park Wash uh, uh, on security issues. Hopefully, David will still join us. Okay. I'm here. Oh, you're here. Fantastic, David. Excellent. <laughs> that's very good. A little I'm early, ready. but I'm here. Okay, that's fine. Yes, it's very early where you are. You had to get up early. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, now, uh, what the format is that there will be uh, um, five questions to each of the, um, the speakers. Um, and um, let me begin then. The first question is that the 12 strategies, and I ask the organizers please to put them on the screen. We had, of course, in this working group, this has been going for some months, and we came up with a list of 12 strategies for enhancing CSO, or civil society organization capabilities. And as we, before we kind of move on from there, I'd like to sort of ask you all to reflect uh, on, on these 12 uh, strategies and uh, uh, tell us which ones do you see as the most important and promising and why, and how do you think they could be optimized? Um, perhaps I'll, uh, we'll, we'll start with Mariana, would you like to begin? Uh, thank you, Thomas. It's a great honor for me to be here with you and to share my ideas about these 12 strategies. Actually, I'm quite involved in the first uh, strategy uh, because it uh, somehow embodies uh, uh, the story of uh, my life until now because, you know, I'm former member of parliament in Bulgaria and I'm futurist. And when I was involved in politics, I tried to make some changes in um, election legislation and to uh, lower the threshold for uh, referenda conducting, like in Switzerland. But unfortunately, I didn't succeed. And when I quit the politics, I decided to unite my futuristic expertise and my uh, political experience and gather a small team. And together 
we elaborated uh, a blockchain-based uh, platform for decision-making, consensus building, and discussing. It could also serve as a, a poll of opinion, real-time discussion, and a referenda in uh, small communities or huge communities. So if you allow me, I will show you how it uh, looks like and how it's possible uh, to work among uh, civil society organizations, social movements, because uh, you know, each uh, huge change uh, until now uh, in the uh, each uh, industrial revolutions starts with some new invention from wood, stone, bronze, uh, steam, electricity. And I believe if we go digitized and if we could uh, use uh, technology appropriately, we could uh, make some huge changes. So now I will share my screen, but I have to be allowed to do that. Yes, yes, I'm, I'm sure. Um, Would somebody everybody. from the support group help me because uh, you are given permission, you'll be able to share it now. Yeah, if you just press share screen at the bottom of your screen, there's a button, there's an arrow. Okay. Uh, yes, just a minute, because... Um, There is some problem. Yeah, we can see your screen, but it's a text. No. Uh, just bring up whichever document you want to show. Yes, do you see now? Okay, that's it, yeah. Uh, this is how the platform looks like. Imagine that you are part of a civil society movement or civil society organization and you want to create a digital twin of your organization, of your movement, because you want to maintain uh, the presence of all members, uh, hundreds of thousands at uh, real time, 24 hours, uh, seven days per week. And you could maintain the interest and the capacity and the energy of, of this movement, because you could gather uh, 500,000 people at the same time, uh, at the same day. And you have a question to discuss, for example, how to empower young people in this green economy, in the green economy participation. And what is interesting in this platform is that it introduces uh, liquid democracy or delegative democracy as a service. Uh, what is uh, liquid democracy? I guess most of you know. Uh, you have uh, the chance to vote directly for a certain question, but if you don't feel uh, yourself competent enough, you could delegate your voting right to acknowledge person just for a certain case. So uh, here you have uh, vote info. Uh, if you are opinion leader or if you want to be an influencer, you could accept delegation from other people. This is a sign that you are ready to bear responsibility to represent uh, somebody else in uh, this specific voting. And this is uh, quite interesting for political parties or social movements. Uh, because this is a way for a certain person to become a leader or influencer when he uh, managed uh, to, to succeed and to gather more delegations. But if somebody wants to delegate, to, to vote directly, he would exercise his vote directly. And uh, if somebody wants to delegate votes to another person, this is a way to choose among people uh, in the platform. Uh, why I'm quite proud with this product, because just a year ago, it was just um, an idea. And for this year, we, we managed to organize it and to make it 
software as a service and liquid democracy as a service based on uh, a distributed ladder technology, which is quite close to blockchain technology. And the specific issue of this technology is that nobody uh, can interrupt in the process. Even the administrator of the process could not change the data. So uh, each participant in the process could be sure that uh, nobody could compromise the data. And it's quite mm -hmm. important when we conduct uh, referendums, real-time discussions, consensus uh, buildings. Mm -hmm. So I believe that um, this platform could be a digital twin of our future organizations like United Nations, World Health Organization, uh, social movements, uh, political movements, uh, and other structures. And I'm quite curious to go to pilot project uh, with uh, this platform. Okay. Thank, thank you, Mariana. I think we must move on to the other speakers. That was quite a lot. I know it's important to you, and I think it's very uh, uh, valuable because, after all, if you think of the French Revolution, it was all about finding new ways for people to make decisions together. And we, sh we need to make progress on that, at that frontier. We need to find better, more trusted, more reliable, more inclusive ways of making decisions. And that will, will be useful for any organization. People will feel they own it. They feel more ownership and more a sense of, of being really a part of it. And and having uh, control over the direction together with others. Okay, so that's 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 great. Can we move on now maybe to uh, Obiora? Uh, um, what do you think about the 12 strategies? Any ones that stand out or that uh, you, you would? Uh, uh, I would like to say, um, thank you very much, Thomas. The 12 strategies have been developed after extensive consultations with stakeholders and in summary, they start from what uh, Mariana has tried to put across the entire internal de um, democracy process through, for example, um, uh, partnership building and bridging gaps between the global and, um, and, and, and global goals and local context, including CSO support to local CSOs, reorienting or online campaigns, for example, and so on. But I find particularly very key and very uh, adequate the each two of them. One is the building partnership with academic actors. Our world is managed by people who have passed through higher education institutions. They are medical doctors, they are lawyers, many of them are bankers, they are heads of states of governments, they are those in parliaments and who make the rules for the rest. We have 7.7 .7 billion human beings in the world. Those who have gone to school and come out with certificates are those who cause the most trouble. Reason, how do we engage them in terms of building a partnership around ethics? If teachers in institutions will teach their students the right things to do, not just knowledge, but also transmitting a certain form of um, uh, values, character, personality, integrity, we will have a better world because I cannot be a graduate of a banking industry and I do fraud in the bank. I cannot be a student of governance in a university political science and I do election rigging. I cannot be an engineer who knows and I just manufacture things that kill people and sell fake drugs. So the issue about civil society, building partnership with academic actors is for me singularly very particular. And this is what I do at Globe Ethics. I just want to summarize it by saying, if we transmit education, values-based education, into the work of CSOs to engage academic actors in higher education institutions, also in the lower ones, we will have a, a ethics go into empowerment of the youth. They are the majority of those in the world. It will go into transforming societies from inside, not just the buzzword, but the reality of transformation. It will go into integrity. When I speak, then I speak with integrity, with honor. It's not just about talking. It's about looking at the face and looking at what we do. 
It goes into the holistic approach. Thomas, what you call comprehensive a method of inclusion. The holistic approach brings in everything. It goes into competence, who can do what, and not who has what color, and who has what background. And it goes also into sustainability, which keys into the SDGs. And this is ethics. Mm -hmm. This is what the acronym for ethics stands for. So I will pick that one, building partnerships among the 12. And I will pick also bridging gaps between global goals and local actors. Mm -hmm. The sentence is think globally, act locally. So this will be my contribution for this round. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Everyone. That's that's very important important points and close to my heart. The, the link to the academic world, you know, uh, it, it makes me think of uh, Greta Thunberg's uh, statement: "We stand behind the signs." But then it's good to also know the signs, and that means knowing the scientists and to work together more closely. That would be great. Yeah, that would be really great. Uh, may I now pass on to David, please? To David, what's what's your uh, take on on these? Uh, you've been one of the main contributors too to the twelve, to the development of this uh, uh, first draft uh, list. But uh, what what are your reflections now, looking back? Uh, well, uh, well, as you know, Thomas, we have just completed the four series, uh, four session series in Canada of. Uh, uh, what will happen in Canada, what we think will happen in Canada. Uh, for those that don't know me, my, my field is strategic foresight. Um, the worst things that have ever happened to me in my life happened to me because I didn't look ahead enough. Um, there are no experts on the future. We got billions of experts right now. In fact, everybody that's on the internet is an expert. Uh, so, that's fine, except they don't know what's going to happen in the future. Uh, so they're not experts. If they're thinking about the future and transformation and action that's going to come. So I would like to see more attention paid to looking ahead at what the context might be for all these very fine initiatives. Uh, a plan, a strategy is only as good as the context it is carried out in. And most of the problems we face today are as bad as they are because we haven't done foresight. We haven't looked ahead. We haven't sat down together, a diverse group of people with different opinions, different interests, different backgrounds, different learning experiences, and talked about what change might bring two years, five years, 10 years out in the future. And I raise this because ever since the Millennium Development Goals, I was always a little bit nervous because they were looking ahead and, and, and the Millennium Development Goals seemed to be okay but they weren't looking at the context that was going to be existing in 2015. And now we have the sustainable development goals. More globally focused, more diverse, more inclusive. Um, 2030. Let's look at what if Donald Trump wins a second term? That takes him into the middle of the decade that we have left to accomplish the sustainable development goals. How will that affect our efforts in those 12 issues? I don't know, but I think we should discuss how they might affect the efforts. Very famous futurist, foresight practitioner, who was a very important person in Royal Dutch Shell, said that we should get the discussion off what might happen to what we would do if it did happen. So as has been mentioned already, gaps, change, uh, partnerships, but in what context? Mm. So as okay. I've made well, the point, yeah. the World Academy a number of times, I think uh, one of the standing committees in the bylaws should focus more 
on strategic foresight activities. In many ways, that's what we're doing today. Exactly, Thanks, yes. Bob. Yeah, thank you, David. Yeah, that's very true. I agree with you. It's, uh, you know, we have to exercise our faculty of active imagination, as Henry Corbin called it, and actually posit ourselves in the future and work towards a shared vision of that future that we all can uh, be comfortable with. I pass on now to uh, Hong Mei Li. Uh, Hong is a student leader, and we're very happy to have a student voice. Uh, what, what was your take on those strategies, uh, looking at them? And also, I think we're already into the second question, kind of, you know, if there's any you would uh, reconceptualize, like David just did, uh, um, I think we, we can conflate the two questions in a, in a way, yeah. Yeah, I think, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I'm sharing this from a personal story. Um, I, I think the first strategy that is most important, and I think all of them are really valuable, but similar to Dr. Eek and many of you share, is bridging the gap between global goals and local action through partnerships and local and um, global CSAs. That's really critical because often we say think global and um, act local. So specifically, I'm giving an example of Art of Living Foundation as a volunteer and also um, International Association for Human Value of their youth movement. Uh, they are uh, th taking the goals local, taking, think globally and also act locally. So I know for the Art of Living Foundation, there's many projects. They have uh, projects in India on sustainability water sanitation, building toilets, teaching breath and water sound for trauma release, both in uh, India as well as in U.S. Um, doing Katrina. Uh, currently in U.S. doing COVID-19, we have the, uh, the Blacks uh, Riot Movement um, and also the healthcare, we are addressing the mental wellness and as an important civic leader. That's the most critical part of the service project. From a personal perspective, I came to this space uh, when I was doing my PhD in chemistry back in the days. And it was really taking a toll on my physical being. I was ending up, I was working full time and also in graduate school and taking care of my disabled parents. So how do I um, take care of that when there's so much demand and physically ending up in the hospital with the kidney infection for a week. And I was like, well, I need to do something about it. So I noticed that once I stumbled upon this with a colleague who's in studying MD, PhD in neuroscience, is like, well, you know, this can help increase the productivity. And I was like, okay, yes, this is what I want. I need to be more productive coming from a student perspective. Um, but then it actually becoming more than that. It become building relationships with not only with my own personal relationship, but also partnership that enabled me to do uh, at work. Specifically, um, I became a project manager at University of Pennsylvania. I built partnership with um, like Mexico uh, National Institute of Health, as well as um, Costa Rica's ambassador. So I noticed that all these relationships I embrace is and diversity I embrace is do it because I feel the social connection within myself and also then I'm able to be have more empowerment to share as a leader how can I better the other people around the world so with that being in mind then all the other strategy can be optimized example diversity be able to be more sensitive with other be able to understand what are the different background they're coming from and be able to make a decision because when you're stressed and you are, have all these things going on and not be able to make a demographic decision democratic decision oh, and building trust because once you trust yourself you can be able to have trust with other and definitely in academia um that's all across the sectors, how do you build collaboration? And going back to a uh, green um, coalition and economic empowerment, that's all collaborated. So I think first, I would start local, which is yourself, then think global and how can you empower the world and also the movement of the um, political movement as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's a very important point. It's very important at this at this moment in time that civil society actors look up and notice all the others who are working uh, in, in the same or, or, or similar uh, uh, fields and to not look at them as competitors but as allies 
and as people moving in the same direction and to join join forces, that's very important. Ash, finally, Ash Bachuri, please. Uh, what what are you, is your take on this? You must uh, un unmute yourself first, uh, Ash. Yes, uh, I wanted to say thank you very much. I'm honored to be here. And I would also say, I think that these are very comprehensive. I think the 12 strategies. However, as I reflect on them and I relate to them in terms of a lot of the work that we've been engaged with and I've personally been involved with across the field of development, uh, you know, the, the climate, uh, youth climate movement, and also um, a lot of community movements in terms of health and help access. I would say um, I also relate like a lot of the other speakers uh, and panelists prior to me, uh, though the issue of bridging gaps between glo global uh, goals and local action through partnerships is one that I would underscore. And the reason I, I would wanna do this is, um, I think that this one in particular embraces a very, very important element where we have a lot of young people from different places and different spheres. And as we start to think about youth really taking, uh, engaging in meaningful action and being involved in global decision-making and playing a part in terms of making the changes that we're talking about and we're all, that put, bring us all together over here is really important for young people from different uh, spaces, including those that often, even in our inclusive like the Black Lives Matter uh, uh, current uh, sort of movement that we are witnessing, oftentimes the inclusive approaches actually end up being exclusive because we still leave people out. Uh, so I think it's, I, th I think I relate a lot to this one because we do want voices from the ground. And I know you also talk about amplifying voices, particularly in uh, the one that you talk about, you know, exemplary uh, action being magnified using media and so on. So I, I think they're all very interconnected, but it's really important to understand that there are young people and there are communities that often get left out, but they're doing, they're actually leading change on the ground. It's just that we need spaces where they're able to meaningfully engage, not tokenistically, but and also be able to build partnerships at global level where they not only are able to affect change in terms of global decision making but, and, and, um, and also representing peers, uh, but also being able to demonstrate and amplify that change. And I've seen this in the field as I've done a lot of work that it makes a very big difference and it really does transform and strengthen leadership. So uh, like, like I said before, I think that they're, they're all they're really important and it's a very, it is indeed a very comprehensive way of looking at it, but there are some that, that I think uh, stand out. And it's uh, mostly the one that I mentioned, which is that we need more voices from the ground to, um, to be amplified and connected with global partnerships and be able to engage in terms of affecting change through decision-making beyond tokenistic engagement. Yes, thank you. I completely you. agree. In fact, uh, my own research in Indonesia is with farmers who, who are activists for sustainability, and they have an organization of one and a half million people and doing fantastic work, but nobody knows about it, or nobody would know about it if they hadn't in the last few years uh, gone into a partnership with La Via Campesina, and now they're going all over Southeast Asia, training other farmers in their innovative methods which is fantastic. It just illustrates the potential of you know, bringing those silent heroes at the local level uh, into a more global, uh, to a more global uh, audience. Okay, uh, uh, we, we have to be mindful of the time. So I'm going to go um, to question four and um, Ash has already started. But back to you, Mariana, uh, how do you see the role of youth in civil society? That's something I definitely want to dwell on for a moment. From my political experience perspective, I must confess that uh, young people are not uh, quite often included. They are situated at the backstage as a necessary facade, as a uh, good community to, to be addressed to, but they are not really participating decision-making process. 
and we have to stop this uh, kind of hypocrisy uh, because uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, in political context, politicians always refer to young people when they need to vanish their image. And I believe the same holds true uh, in uh, uh, other perspectives. Uh, so um, I, I think that uh, we might suggest um, some kind of um, alternative approach you know, when uh, opposite parties here in Bulgaria want to gain some uh, advantages, they offer an alternative uh, government or the so-called government in shadow. So we could uh, suggest of a board of uh, organization of young people to be alternative or even a partner of uh, such kind of a global uh, governance fund. And we could start this initiative as a next step uh, of our uh, common efforts here. That's, that that's a fantastic idea. Thank you. You know, I'd like having a, a youth shadow government of the world. Is that right? Is that, yeah? Not shadow, okay. but alternative or fresh or... Yeah. Fresh. Admi Various levels, perhaps, yes, yes, at various levels, yeah. Okay, and Obioa, I'm sorry you have to rush a little bit because of, yes. we want to have uh, time for the participants. Um, thank you very much. Uh, we look at the comprehensivity of all these, um, uh, what you might call all these goals. I think each of them plays a role. But I'm looking at our youth, and I'm looking at large potentials of young people around the world sleeping and snoring not interested in what affects their lives. And yet, it is these youth that we use for all the troubles in the world. They are those who are in the army, killed in war fronts, dying for what they do not know about, fighting other people's wars. They are those who don't go to school. It is these youth, for example, who suffer all the illnesses in the world. Tell me one youth leader in any political game, in any nation, very young, who's managing the affairs of the world. And yet we have old people, gerontocrats, running mm. governments, when they should retire and allow their young people to, that's transgenerational. I'm looking at the social contract. The social contract said, we need as human beings to hand over our individual liberties and sovereignties to a government. The state will manage our affairs and we did. So the youth played their role, society played their role. But what happened? Governments hijack the power, they lock you up, they make the laws that fit them, and they, do, they carry you into war, they do not progress your good, and they mislead you. They even cause wars that destroy nations. They build nuclear bombs which we do not need. So this is where the role of CSOs, civil society organizations, comes in. But civil society organizations and youth cannot perform without values. And it is this ethical value. It's not just about taking power, not even about adding. It is about a value addition. And the value addition are around those things we have tried to say, we want transformation for the quality of the human person. The human person is central. It's not an, a, a tool. It is a being, a subject. It's not to be used. It's not a utility. The human being is at the center of development. This is where civil society organizations must key in. But the media is a disgrace in many times and in many places. The media is manipulative. The media is even working for the corporates and working, for example, just to blow those who pay them. So we must be in a way to take back power. And you can only take back power by knowledge. Youth go to school. Youth learn something. Youth stand for something. Youth be empowered with transformation, ethical ingredients, and value. If you don't stand for something, you will not die for anything. So we need to stand for something. We need to stand for goodness. We need to say it and not be afraid of anything. And this is where I think the youth need to be challenged. And civil society organizations are best placed to challenge the youth. And we need civil societies because governments have failed. So we have now non-governmental organizations to complement the failures of government. And that non-governmental organization, they need a place, they need a scope. 
They need finances. They also need media. They need partnerships. They, but above all, they need ethical ingredients of education that put them above governments. I cannot change and become the same. I must transform for the better. And the better is the good life. And that good life is what World Academy of Arts and Science, what GlobeEthics.net in Geneva is trying to do. Use your knowledge because that's what makes you different from an animal. Rationality. Why must I do right, different from wrong? Uh, not political, financial, money, egoistic, greedy. Everybody has six feet under the earth. You just die, they bury you. And that's all. You have only a short time on this world. So why can't I change? Youth of the world, wake up, sit up, stop snoring and sleeping and doing nothing and looking only on the, take power and go into politics and go and vote when it is time to vote. Yes, that would be okay. my thank experience. you, thank you, Viola. And uh, uh, um, uh, David, what, what is your take on the role of youth? Or where do you see youth? Uh, um, as some of you might know, when this working group started, I advocated for changing the title to Youth and Civil Society, putting youth first. Hmm. Um, I, I still feel very strongly about this because in part, it's, it's a foresight thing. Uh, whether we like it or not, whether we believe in it or not, in the future, today's youth will be the leaders. So they must start preparing now. They must be given the facilities and the right to begin preparing now. And that's the reason I have advocated for years moving away from the term leadership or leadership to leadingship. Any organization that doesn't make every member of the organization eligible to suggest a change, to suggest an improvement, to suggest something is wasting leading. Every one of us, every single one of us at some point in time can lead. And as has just been pointed out, governments haven't done a very good job lately. I, am, I recall, you remember 10 years ago, if somebody said to you, BRICS, Brazil, Russia, China, India, and South Africa, everybody would smile and say, ah, yeah, the future of the world. And now look at the BRICS. They're all BRICS, B-R-I-C-K-S. They're all having massive problems. We could have foreseen that. The youth in those countries is having a very difficult time. But those youth will be the leaders of those countries in 10, 12, 15, 18, 20 years. So this brings me to the number three, gaps between global goals and local action. I think again, gaps between local action and global goals. The globe will remain a patchwork but local action is where it's going to be at. And I think you've all mentioned that in, in each in your own ways. Thank mm. you. Thank you, yeah. Okay, but now to our two youth voices, um, Hong Mai Li and uh, Ash Bachari. Um, uh, uh, Hong Mai, would you like to begin and give us a youth perspective on youth? Thank you so much. I think um, many of you already answered part of my my answer, so I'll just keep it brief and short. Um, I see youth as the catalyst, as a chemist's perspective, for social change. So they are really like the mechanism beyond making the next level. But then what really prevent them is a kind of what Dr. Eek says, like they are sleeping, right? They're stressed, they have so much going on. Specifically in universities, many of them are having a mental illness such as like, oh, suicidal thought because my grade's not doing well or whatever peer pressure that they're having, right? So then the, what are the solutions I can see this as? I see the programs that I volunteer for, the Sky Campus Happiness Program in university setting teaches the breathing technique and service orientation and leadership to be able to think 
just not about what's happening with me, just the small gray things that's happening, but really a broader perspective globally what's happening. So kind of go back with Dr. Harris see, saying earlier, think you know, global and still act local. So going back to the early answer as well, is that not just seeing the small things that's happening right now, it's also what can I do for the world? So when they start doing services, when they're being activating and hearing their voices, and the service project is not like we give to them, it's really what they inspire to do. So doing these programs um, in Sky Campus Happiness Program and also Sky School, which is from middle school, like four till 18, they're doing these programs where they empower as part of the curriculum to think not just about myself, it's how I can do for the world. Okay, thank you. Over to you, Ash. Sure, thank you so much. Um, I would also echo some of the voices we've already heard. And I wanna say that um, in, in, in the experience that, that I have had working with young people in different parts of the world, one of the things that really does uh, make a difference in terms of youth, meaningful youth engagement and leadership is really peer-to-peer -peer programs uh, where we can really affect structural change and have um, young people working by and for young people. So programs led by young people for young people are really those that are hugely powerful and inspirational. I also wanna say some of the approaches do make a difference in terms of the role, the meaningful role of youth in society. And that is really using participatory approaches. So having approaches that have the voices of youth engaged in programs, uh, hopefully by and for youth, uh, make a difference because those are much more sustainable as we talk about sustainable development goals and sustaining the, the change that we're talking about. Really, they become owned by the community if, they're, if the community's voices are engaged in the design of those programs. So I think that that really does uh, affect, affect long lasting change. And, and it's like the saying about teaching a man to fish uh, and feeding him for a night versus teaching him uh, how to fish. Uh, and, and, and so I think the important thing is to teach people how to fish. And, and part of that is engaging youth in the process of designing programs in any case. And, and I think finally, uh, as we think about youth, the important thing is to think of young people as leaders of today, as certainly leaders of tomorrow, but also leaders of today. And therefore engaging uh, young people at the level of at, at school. And I know that uh, Dr. Ikis mentioned this, but it's really important that young people get to practice this and it's not theoretical. Um, and it's not limited to just a few people, but really if you want to affect change, and like you said, Ms. Hongme is catalyzing that change, we need to be able to work at scale, and therefore we need to start to think about how to institutionalize this, and I think this was raised even in the course of the first question, but building that, those values, the integrity, and starting to practice it at school level is critical, and therefore our teachers uh, are also key in this process. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, we should now open discussion. We haven't gone through all the questions yet, but I think in, in one way or another, we've all been able to, to say what, what we wanted to, and uh, uh, I'd like to really move to the questions now. Um, the first one is uh, from Shangrok Muvahednia, if I hope I pronounce that correctly. correctly. And... Uh, the question is about uh, corporations, multinational corporations, and the fact that um, so much of the development process, uh, the economic system is in the hands of these corporations. Um, so, um, and they have cartels and they, they, have, they, mon they monopolize some of the tools of development. So how can we change that? And, makes me think of the opening session yesterday about multilateralism when there was much lament and why do, you know, why don't we have, we, we have a lack of political leaders. And I think part of it is because they're not really very uh, much political leaders because the political class has been undermined by becoming servile to corporate interests all over the world. So you can't expect them to be very good at solving 
problems associated with the global commons. But uh, how do you think um, uh, that you know the problem of the the, the the great power of corporations can be addressed, especially from the civil society end? Um, Mariana, would you like to, uh, or since since you have a, a background in politics, <laughs> how how do you think um, that no. can be? that we should go beyond the uh, uh, typical state systems of capitalism or socialism and we have to uh, re recalibrate the expectation of uh, technology dominance or um, deitism uh, which is explained by Yuval Harari and we have to, to go beyond it and to try to convert it to some kind of uh, new utopia for the world, new uh, big idea such as blue planetary, environmentalism, uh, collaboration or something like that. But this is just uh, notions, just ideas and we have to put the uh, content in that kind of ideas and to elaborate a kind of action plan uh, step by step, uh, step by step, engage with concrete uh, time frame and measures what to do to 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 get to to this uh, not utopia but but new reality. Uh, but it's difficult just for two or three minutes to to uh, make very clear statement how to do that. But I believe this could be. Uh, gathered by systematic approach and uh, holistic thinking. Something mm -hmm. like uh, uh, World Academy of Art and Sciences uh, already do. No. More broadly, would anybody else uh, like to, of the panelists, mm -hmm. speak on that relationship between the corporate sector and civil society? Uh, it's very important. We always address ourselves to politics, but rarely do we, uh, you know, uh, yeah, Thomas, I would like to add value to that. Um, definitely, um, business is important for society. Business is enterprise. It is the art of making money and of making markets and of making products. Some businesses are successful, then they grow and become global players. Some are not and they remain as small enterprises. We cannot undermine the importance of businesses globally. They serve society. And it is not about envy, it's about the fruit of hard work. If you work hard, you produce. But there must be regulations. Where we have the problem is when corporates become the laws upon themselves, when they are not regulated. When, for example, you make money, you buy a government, you buy a state, you corrupt the system, you corrupt the legal infrastructures, you are not accountable. This is where civil societies must confront such businesses by shaming them, by using the media to expose the bad practices. Explain to me how someone will go to the Niger Delta and drill oil from the earth and drill oil in such a way that the entire environment is polluted and make big money and not even spend a dime to clean up the rubbish. And then people cannot fish, they cannot go to farm, they have no jobs, they die of the bad gas and you, stay, you say you're making business and you're making money and you're a global number one. That is not only unethical, it is a clear case of where civil society must engage. But we have governments. What are the governments doing? That is why you need a good government. And a good government is made up of people who have brain, who think with their heads and think with their souls and think with their heart. And they are the types of persons whom when you put in power, you check them also. I don't just give you power and leave you. I give you power and I control how you use the power. This is the power of the youth and of civil societies. And we can pull down governments. It's happened all over the world. So I do think that corporates are important. Businesses are necessary, but they must fulfill the regulations and work for the common good. And this is where they need check and balance. Okay, thank you. I'd, I'd just like to add briefly though that there are options also for uh, civil society di to directly influence the corporations, not just through the political process, but by, through boycotts and all kinds of actions. Ash, you, you want to unmute yourself and comment on that? You're still muted. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I was gonna, I was gonna actually flag the point exactly that uh, that you know there's a, there's a lot of power in in the consumer and civil society and young people in influencing change and and businesses and and their ability to succeed or not is is dependent on on the consumer. Uh, but of course, also we know that I want to build on the point that Dr. Ike mentioned, which is that we talk a lot about governments, but businesses are also very important and powerful, and and a lot of governments. Are dependent upon businesses, and so those those groups are very powerful. And business and, and governments come back uh, over and over sometimes, uh, or or co come into power because of businesses. So uh, it is a very important stakeholder. It's hard to leave out, and um, and and the 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 decision uh, of of young people and and consumers in the process of helping businesses uh, survive and, and thrive is, is, is critical. So yeah, I was yeah. Uh, gonna yeah. actually highlight that. Uh, we mustn't forget business also quite heterogeneous. There are those who might pollute the Niger Delta and that's terrible. And uh, on the other hand, there are also companies that are quite progressive and positive and have good leadership. Uh, so I guess there's, there's a, you know, we, there's a, a big scope and we must reward those who, uh, um, um, who do the right thing. And there's another question that we, we need to move on. Thomas, uh, could I, could, okay, could uh, I bring something? Yes. Okay. Could uh, I bring something up here? Yes, please, um, go on. Go on. Uh, we are in a situation today where many corporations are bigger than many countries in terms of wealth, in terms of, in some cases, number of people. Hmm. Um, I think we have to go back to the business about learning. We have to have in schools, part of our education system, informing, uh, making more aware youth as they go through the school, college and university system of the situation that exists now so that they will have a more informed basis to improve things in their future when they're leaders. Hmm. Right now, a 15 year old is not gonna tell Facebook what to do or LinkedIn COVID or general dynamics. Hmm. But in 20 years, who knows, that person might've got the background, the experience to be somebody important in that organization. And if he or she knows, hmm. is aware of the situation, he or she will be more able to make the changes they feel are necessary or good. Yes, thank you, David. I was about to hand over to you with the second question, which is about you know creating, how can we create the context for our goals to be achievable? And that's from Anne Snake, and she, she was uh, agreeing with you on the futuring, but education is so vital in shaping that future. But uh, can we get away from the word education yeah. and get to learning? Okay. Because when we say education, there's all these structures and big brick buildings and things where a lot of learning that is very valuable today is experiential or cultural or community or, or even outdoors. And therefore, I think if we can work on the learning rather than thinking education, because that immediately takes us back inside the school. Hmm. Thank you. So taking it taking learning out of the institutions or finding new new spaces and modes of learning uh, is, is, I think that's a very good idea. There's um, uh, an, another question from Sarah Garcia. Uh, she says, I agree that we need to have a clear vision of the world we want to leave and create with the young people. And we need to create an integral education program that develops or learning program that develops the various dimensions of the person, value, uh, something that's more value centered. Um, so the question is, ha uh, have you got any good practices to share? I think Obiora, that's really what you do, uh, isn't it? Uh, um, uh, putting uh, values at the center of, of learning. Would you like to comment on this question? very fast and thank you very much Thomas. The thing about values goes from values to ethics because there are all sorts of values but we must also value the value. Yeah, just like um, Frederick Nietzsche will talk about the devaluation of all values towards bringing out the best values. I mean there are points of view 
that um, uh, just back David uh, concerning education. Educo educare is about leadership. I mean, it can be misused. Any word can be misused, but we'll have to buy, take it back and use education to train how to learn. The thing about education is that when you bring in ethics into education, you bring empowerment, transformation, integrity, holistic approach, competence, and sustainability. If it goes into the classroom everywhere in the world, we have made it. This is where we want to reach, and that's what we are trying to do at globeethics.net, at the World Academy of Arts and Science, at the Club of Rome, influencing society by bringing in values to transform society. This is our work, and it's just not finished. We are just at the beginning, and this conference teaches us the long way to go. And I must want to commend Ash and Marianne and Hong and David himself, of course, you, Thomas, for giving us this opportunity because I'm looking at our time running. Um, I just want to see that we, 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 there is another program that's coming up again at 1 p.m. today, and that will be one and a half hours. We have enough time to continue this conversation. I look forward to it. Thank you so much. Excellent. Thank you, Obiora. And Obiora will be chairing that second uh, uh, session, and I will be just uh, filling the questions. And um, there's one question we, we didn't answer. We're out of time. I just wanted to briefly say, uh, you know, it, it, the question was about what should be the top priority for civil society. And if I may uh, use my privilege as a chair to say that I feel that whatever it may be, and there are different takes on that, it's got to involve mobilization because um, it's, we, we have to remember that civil society organizations are just a small part of civil society at large. And the larger part is still uh, not active and not on the streets and not organized. And that's the real overwhelming challenge to really mobilize more people to get involved, to reach out into the communities at all levels. Okay, well, I hope uh, to you, uh, to all the participants, I hope um, you will join us again at one o'clock. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye.